Hello and welcome back to Radio Free Urbanism. I am one of your hosts, Alex Williams, and today I'm joined by three co-hosts. We'll start with our very special guest. We've got Alexandra here with us today. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for having me. Um, I'm Alexandra. I'm an urban planner. I'm one of the founders of Untitled Planning. So you we were thankful, we're grateful for you to, for having Sammy on a few weeks ago. So I'm here to give another perspective, I suppose, on our work. Um, I'm also the founder of uh, Urban the Metro, which is a podcast focusing on African urbanism and celebrating different initiatives happening across Africa and the diaspora. Um, and what else do I do? I also work at the Infrastructure Institute at the School of Cities at the University of Toronto. Um, and that's a, a research hub where we focus on like training, um, advisory and a number of different things and research, of course, um, related to uh, community, uh, creative mixed use development, social purpose real estate and a number of different things. So busy bee, but I'm happy to be here. So thanks, everyone. Awesome. Yeah, we're stoked to have you. We're glad to have the other half of Untitled Planning on our show today. And of course, my two friends who uh, need no introduction, that's uh, Nick Laporte and Ethan Myers. You welcome guys back. Welcome back, viewers. Okay. <laughs> I was like, are they going to say hi? Are they going to say welcome back? We're just going to be silent of, you know, here, you know. Yeah, you go with one of us and then the other. There, you yeah, went Alex both and at the I, same at time. At the same time, yeah. Uh, we'll, Al no Alex and I will do, we'll yeah. do our own show. We'll do Basically. like the Alex Urbanism podcast. Yeah. And you guys can be silent parties. We'll just have you in the corner on the video, just sitting there uh, yeah. listening intently to our beautiful <laughs> insights uh, into urbanism. We've got a few interesting stories today, a few fun ones and a few depressing ones. Uh, so today's gonna be like kind of a mix of emotions, I expect, but hopefully we learn something and hopefully uh, we can find ways to, to improve our cities through what we're talking about here today. We're gonna start off with Nick. He's got a little something he wants to update us on. This is coming from Vancouver, the city in which I reside. And this is happening right now at city council Council, a councillor is proposing measures to revisit and enhance 30 kilometer per hour speed limits on local streets in Vancouver, along with some traffic calming solutions, stuff that I've talked about on my YouTube channel on multiple occasions, which is fantastic, is going to amount to anything. I think probably not. It's a pretty majority conservative council right now that whose prerogative seems to be just more studies. Oh, we have to do a feasibility study over and over and over. It's like a 30 kilometer per hour speed limit on local streets is a no brainer. Like, Nobody needs to be going 50 kilometers an hour on somebody's street where people live, people are biking, people are playing. It's it's crazy. But well, we're going to talk more about that next week because we're going to find out the results of that. And it also is going to relate to a story that I'm talking about later in the episode. Okay. I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited to get into Same. that story again next week. Um, in the meantime, Ethan, what's up? Ladies and gentlemen, um, I actually did a collaboration video pretty recently. If you folks have ever heard of More Than Transit, he is a good friend of the podcast here. And he just made a video titled, How to Add Transit Services to New Neighborhoods. And I did a little section on there. So if you want to go check that out, go support More Than Transit. They're still a pretty small creator. They make great content. I highly recommend you go check them out. Great videos. But yeah, that's that's what's it for me. Yeah. Uh, and I've got a little update, of course, with RCG upzoning, hopefully coming to Calgary. I have been out preaching the good word. I even uh, bothered some people on the bus to uh, university <laughs> uh, the other day. I got off the bus, started up a conversation with a couple people in into whom uh, conversation I was eavesdropping. And, uh, and uh, they invited me to join the conversation. At which point I said, hey, come speak at City Council on April 22nd, 2024 to uh, get this upzoning to happen, to provide more property rights for homeowners and more housing for Calgarians, a bun uh, among a bunch of other uh, great benefits. So I'm excited about that project. I also launched the YouTube channel Unsprawling this week, which is going to be a Calgary-focused, entirely Calgary-focused urbanism channel where I'm working with other Calgary urbanists on making our city a great place to be. So stay tuned over there on Unsprawling to uh, to hear some interesting conversations about our city. And uh, yeah, we're excited to have Alexandra on the show. I want to hear before we get into our news stories, is there anything else, anything burning that uh, you got to tell us before we get into things? 
Yeah, I mean, actually, I just thought of something. Uh, well, we uh, at Untitled Planning, we 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 started a a new series, which is called we're calling the Pop Culture Pop Culture Club, um, and basically we're reviewing different mu- uh, movies and um, TV shows and like books like that are you know beloved near and dear to all our hearts or some of our hearts and maybe some more obscure ones and connecting and drawing parallels between like you know whatever that's going on in those films and, what, and whatever's happening um, like from in, in our cities and in urban planning and, and in geography. And so we have our first episode launching at the end of this week. We're reviewing the Sweet. movie, uh, well, musical actually, Burlesque, featuring none other than Extina, Christina Aguilera, <laughs> and Madame Cher. So um, if you like this blend of films and urbanism, then yeah, check it out. I'm actually super stoked for that. That is, is like, exciting. that yeah. is right up my alley. Every time I'm watching a movie, and there's a train in it. I was just, I love trains. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, yeah. 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 That is such a cool project. It's like that okay. one scene from uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood where uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character is like, hey, 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 <laughs> hey. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's exactly, exactly me. Uh, I'm excited. I'm excited for this. Uh, I'll I'll put a link in, in the description when, when that first episode comes out because that's, uh, I feel like that's something our audience would probably be into. Yeah. Because... Um, who doesn't like pop culture mixed with their favorite, you know, urbanism, political thing. I know? love that. I'm looking yeah, forward to that. Great. Yeah. It's great. It's exciting. But yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm my side, not my side hustle, but like my side, I guess, activities are, I love a good movie and I love commenting on movies. A letterbox is one of my favorite apps right now. Um, nice. So yeah, <laughs> I'd love to comment on them and everything. Like every, I, I, I joke that everything is ur- urban planning. If you, really like think about it you can find a way to connect it so even something as something as something as a wild as not wild but like as burlesque that you think is kind of unrelated there are there's lessons to be learned basically we we try to go through them so yeah 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 my wife has learned that very well that lesson (laughs) as my comments are endless and she's like oh my god here we go again yeah 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 it's never it's never ending we see it everywhere like once you start thinking about it it's everywhere yeah Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm super stoked for that series. I'm, I'm going to super promote, promote that because I think that's like a perfect blend. And I, I hope that like starts to break the urbanism bubble a little bit and like mm-hmm. get some other people interested in what we're talking about. And, and maybe they'll start seeing it in their own pulp culture thing that they're, they're getting involved in. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fingers crossed. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm stoked for that. Uh, okay, Ethan, you've got a you've got a story for us. So everybody, um, some super exciting news actually. Uh, the U.S. President Joseph Robinette Biden is going to be <laughs> meeting with the Prime Minister of Japan, and they're going to be actually talking a little bit about high speed rail, or at least Joe Biden wants to do that because he's kind of hinted at it. He's always been kind of known as a rail guy, but. Uh, I think uh, the coverage from a local paper, because this focus of this talk of high-speed rail is mainly focusing on Texas, since a lot of Japanese companies are interested in building high-speed rail for the Texas Triangle, Mm. that being Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio. So there's interest to do that, and since they want to talk about that, it's only fair that local news coverage covers this event that's going on here. Now... The local paper that covered this is the Cron, and they are a Houston-based newspaper. And they wrote a actually pretty decent article. However, I do have one little issue with it. The article is titled, Biden expected to talk Japanese high, or high-speed rail with Japanese prime minister. And the real issue that I have with it here is that the quote underneath the first image for this article is in fact, it, it's hilarious, folks. I, I can't, I can't honestly believe it. I'm actually just looking for it here. But the actual quote underneath the picture is: "The long-awaited light rail, light rail between Houston and Dallas, is expected to make the agenda in President Biden's talks with the Japanese Prime Minister Fumito Kishida." Oh, and, it looks like uh, it says light rail. I don't know if I... you guys noticed. That. I think they updated it because mine says the long awaited high speed rail system connecting Houston and Dallas. Uh, It does say underneath in the uh, in the images, it should still say that it said it at least 20 minutes ago. But uh, oh, okay, okay. But they had it as light rail. (laughs) They had it as light rail. It was just the caption underneath the image. 
Oh and no, I yeah. see I I see it now. Oh, yeah, they yeah, must yeah, have, yeah. yeah. So, so in one in one spot it says high speed rail, in another spot it says light rail. And for all of our viewers who don't know the difference, light rail is more localized transit. It's also called trams, streetcars. Some great examples we have are the C train, like in Calgary. And I, I don't know about you guys, but that that is not made to go uh, at high speeds, at high speed rail speeds. I don't think you'd be very comfortable taking the C train at three hundred kilometers an hour, as convenient as that would be. And That'd this be kind incredible. of just, it would be. But this just kind of ties back into this thought that there is a lot of media coverage that goes around on just urbanist and especially trains, where it's, it almost seems like journalists just don't have any clue what they're talking about. And it would be really nice for them to actually start consulting, you know, at least some people who know a little bit about trains and, you know, transit planning or city planning in general, just to kind of get, you know, a little bit more informed to do a better job of informing the general viewer. Because they're as small of a difference as this does seem, it is huge. Like this mm -hmm. is like this is yeah, this is calling this is like calling the C train high speed rail. Yeah. And yeah, that is it's just not. It's just not. Yeah. And yeah, we just we really got to get media kind of, you know, more informed on what's going on in transit planning. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, if I, I think it's really important for uh, transit experts and advocates to speak up and get involved locally in these things. Uh, I know uh, there's a couple uh, experts in Calgary who regularly write pieces for the local newspaper who kind of talk about these things. Um, it's important to kind of set yourself up as a go-to person so that when journalists have questions, when they're writing stories like this, you're easy to find and uh, you're easy to be contacted so that you can help make sure that there, there's a little bit more literacy uh, in the media on these things. Yeah, no, it is. It's super important. And yeah, we definitely do need to make, you know, transit planners more well known to the media just in terms of being able to communicate accurate information to the public because stuff like this, I mean, yeah, this can absolutely mess up perspectives. And I mean, this is the more harmless example, but there was actually a more harmful one where it, actually this is here. I'm going to get into a little bit of a rant here right now. Um, you folks may not have noticed this, but there was an article a few days ago that said that the Las Vegas monorail was shutting down. And this was actually blatant misinformation Pretty much a full on, yeah, it was just full on misinformation, completely untrue. It's not shutting down. The Las Vegas monorail had to come out and say, we're not shutting down in the posts and everything like that. But the news had already spread out and I still get people messaging me saying, did you hear the Las Vegas monorail is shutting down? And I'm just like, please, please, we need some media literacy here. Just a little bit, just a drop, not that much, just... <laughs> A little bit. Please read beyond the headlines because I read the original article that said it was shutting down and it was basically just looking at implications of what could possibly happen and no actual certain information. Yeah. Yeah, that's not that's not helpful. Um, I like this story because I love the idea of Texas having like a Japanese style high speed rail. That'd be amazing. Yeah. It's like been... a real legit high-speed rail it's been floated around quite a bit um I, I believe that at the moment they're still looking for someone who's willing to build it but there is promise for the texas triangle to get high-speed rail and it is really exciting i can't deny that it's just yeah we got to get better information out to the journalists so i'm just curious to know who would be responsible for that like is tod getting the right of way and they have to work with like the private companies to build these rail lines or how does that work? Do you know? Uh, I would still imagine that they're kind of ironing it out. But if they're looking for right of way, my guess would be, I mean, yeah, it's really going to be up to the state. I mean, because there is a lot of private land in between that and private land ownership, at least in the U.S., is pretty strong. So we're going to have to see, you know. Unless there's highways and we need to expand the highways then. The, yeah, oh, yeah, matter. of course. TxDOT doesn't. Yeah, they, <laughs> they don't care about your, your property. If you need one more lane on I-35, then, hey, we're getting one more lane. But <laughs> you want to get a train? <laughs> Communist. <laughs> <laughs> 
Man. Yeah, no, it's it's just it, it'll be it'll be a confusing mess when it comes to property rights and everything along that way. And it's definitely still a far out project, especially in terms of high speed rail. But if there's any region in the U.S. that could realistically use high speed rail other than the ones that have already been built or in the middle of the planning process, then, yeah, it's it's the Texas Triangle. Yeah. Um, Alexandra, do you have any uh, any thoughts, comments, concerns about this? Yeah, funnily enough, the only thing that comes to mind, I mean, there's a few things that come to mind, but the, the number one thing that came to mind when you were speaking to the, how funny it was that they wrote light rail is um there's um a running joke. I, I frequently go back to, to Greece. I go to Athens and there's a, there's a tram that runs through the city. Um, There's also a subway system and there's buses, but talking about the tram, because <laughs> it's like one of my favorite, well, actually when I was a kid, it was one of my favorite uh, like modes of of transit at the time. And then as I go back and, and I got older, I remember a friend of mine or a family member telling me that like the running joke about the tram is that like only tourists use it because if you're trying to get anywhere on time, it's not, <laughs> it's not the most feasible way of transit. And it's true. Like I took it, I took it back from like downtown, like where I live is technically like 15 minutes away from like almost anything except by tram. Then it's like an hour. Um, but it's the most scenic route through the city. Um, the most beautiful one, but it takes an eternity. So I'm just trying to picture a tram <laughs> through the triangle that you're talking about um connect yeah what's <laughs> hilarious is that <laughs> what's hilarious about this is that dallas actually does have a light rail system mm -hmm. so when i reposted this article just kind of screaming into the void on twitter um mm -hmm. i had someone come in and say uh the comment they said uh the uh the, the DART um, expansion plan is uh, going on smoothly. So, you know, DART is <laughs> Dallas area rapid transit. Very ambitious. <laughs> Very it's, ambitious it's, plans of running DART to Houston. So uh, it, many it, such it's gonna have It's going to have one station at every single ranch and farm uh, <laughs> between the cities. And they're going to build uh, a massive parking lot for it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I can't wait to see that that project happen. But yeah, it is kind of interesting, like what you're talking about, Alexandra, about the different um, like levels and qualities of our different uh, transit plans and where we want to put um, different things based on based on their use, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's interesting. So Athens has like their their light rail is very tourist oriented. It's like it's it's not. It's just that it's really slow. <laughs> like it goes through oh, okay. the main parts. Like you can can it connects across the city and it goes to all the main. Uh, like it takes you down, downtown to Syntagma Square. Like all the main like places you need to go. But just the speed is just really slow. Um, but it's funny because it I'm has just, its yeah. own track. It's just very slow. Yeah. So there aren't cars that are allowed to use the track. It has its own track the whole way. Yeah, yeah. It's just just very slow. <laughs> huh. <laughs> Which I'm like. Well. It's not bad. It I works. mean, so, it's right. also a different kind of like, like lifestyle. Like if, if Toronto is comparable to New York where things are always very like fast, I think Ath or Athens or like Greece has like a, it's more like chill, <laughs> which I appreciate, but not when I'm trying yeah. to get somewhere on time with the tram. That's it. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think we're probably going to get more into that a, a little bit later. You've kind of brought up some things that I, I have questions for you about and we have a little segment after our stories where uh we get to ask you a few questions cool and uh, pick your brain about a few things so i'm gonna i'm gonna jump into my story here i have some something interesting happened this wasn't the original story that i was going to cover today i originally i uh, was going to cover something suggested by one of our listeners and uh but i'll i'll have to get into that next week or something because it they, they had an interesting story to look at. But this is something that happened locally here in Calgary. And I'll just, I, I wrote this out because I, uh, I don't want to risk getting sued here. So I, I want to, you know, be, be specific. Don't be about, libelous uh, now, Alex. I don't want to be yeah. libelous. So I, I want to be specific about, uh, about my words. So uh, in Calgary, there's a popular shopping slash dining district on 17th Avenue Southwest. Many of the restaurants have patio dining out front, but there are always loud cars driving by making uh driving by making the environment uncomfortable i do have footage of this i have footage of plenty of motorcycles and loud cars with aftermarket exhaust driving down here while i'm trying to enjoy a nice meal on a patio it's it's hard on the experience um but uh but i i go on to say last year 
the BIA, the business improvement area, did a survey. Now, I actually made a mistake here. The I, I found out through the grapevine that the BIA did not survey the public. Mm-hmm. Uh, the BIA serviced it, uh, surveyed its members and uh, and somebody else did a survey of the public, the results of which were not published, at least anywhere that I've been able to find, uh, basically asking, should we pedestrianize? Um, so we don't know we don't know where the results from the public survey done is, and we don't know who did that survey, but the BIA surveyed its members. Now, um, the the businesses surveyed said no. They got twenty three responses. Now, this is a BIA with seven hundred and twenty plus members. Okay, this is like lots of businesses. Twenty three of them responded. 16 said no, and seven said yes. Uh, the executive director said uh, to, uh, to a reporter from Calgary Herald, she said, what was overwhelming is that they just said no. Uh, they got 16 people, 16 businesses said no to the idea of pedestrianization on 17th Avenue. And um, 16 out of 720, that's like 2%. 2% of the businesses, that is not overwhelming. Um, but then this guy, uh, Chris is his name, he made a petition on change.org to try and gather up some support for uh, doing some pedestrianization on 17th Avenue. And he was met with a very interesting email. He sent the petition to the BIA and he even tried contacting some of the board members and, uh, and he got met with an email that was basically, stop talking to us, uh, take down your petition, and, um, uh, or we'll, like, we're threatening legal action um, uh, against this. Uh, it was kind of, it was kind of a, an interesting response to a community member trying to, like, start a conversation and engage in a conversation that honestly has been ongoing. People have been talking about this for years, and it's gotten even um, is it, like people have gotten even more interested in the pedestrianization of this area um, in in recent years and and in recent months even uh, it's become more of a conversation. So that's kind of some some interesting Calgary happenings. And then the guy made a video about it. That's how we <laughs> know about all of this. And tonight this episode will air tomorrow morning, but uh, tonight a couple hours from now, uh, I guess he'll be on CTV talking about it um so we'll we'll see this is a developing story uh but yeah nick nick told me i had to share that. you had to too. it's yeah. it's wild to think like it seems a, again i don't want to be libelous here and this is just what someone else might say I, this is not coming from me but someone might say that somebody sending this email to this uh, small youtuber and community member is a bit unhinged somebody might say that i'm not saying that like but somebody could. Somebody, somebody could. Somebody might. Could. Somebody yeah. might. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and to think that over, I, I said this to Alex before the podcast to say that's overwhelming said no. Overwhelming uh, majority said no. That's great. I said no, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm a Steam yeah. user. I play games on Steam. It has to be 95% or more to be overwhelmingly positive. So, no. It, it's, also, it's just no. also, yeah, let's, uh, let's just look at it from a data perspective. This is, this is just pure data. You have 27 businesses, or 26, if I'm correct, 23 Alex? that 20, responded. Okay, 23 out of how many? Like 620? 720. Out of 720. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's less than 2% response. That's we, we can't extrapolate data from that. I mean, even yeah. if we did, yeah, no, that's just, that seems unrealistic. And, yeah, just... Need a just, bigger just sample size. saying it, yeah, we bigger sample size is needed for accurate results on this one. Yeah, yeah, it's something I'll add to. So Chris says in his video, he says that he has worked in BIAs. Like this is a thing, and he knows like how hard the people who work in BIAs work, mm-hmm. and how important it is for them to like help the businesses do well and help the area be pleasant and welcoming to the people who come there. And, uh, and he lives in the area. He moved to this area specifically because of this, uh, of this shopping district, of the restaurants and the interesting culture that is down this strip of our city. And, uh, and so he's, pre- he's pretty disappointed uh, and upset 
uh, about all of this, but it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Now, Alexandra is a is like an actual human professional <laughs> with like an education. Professional uh, human? Yeah, she's a professional, <laughs> professional human. been doing this for a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so like, I want to hear like what, like, I imagine you've worked with like communities and businesses and stuff. Like what has been your experience um, in having these conversations to try and make an area more productive and more pleasant for people to be in? Yeah, it's funny. Um, in another life or I guess the same life, but yeah, in another life, <laughs> I was working uh, for this organ. Uh, it's a major public arts organization in Toronto called uh, Steps Public Art. Um, and basically okay. during the pandemic, it was like I was a fresh grad from my undergrad and I graduated right into the pandemic. So I was like, ah, the world's ending. And <laughs> my first job, my first official job was I was a, what they call the placemaking assistant. And then over time, I became a Main Streets coordinator. So what I was doing is uh, I was um, uh, coordinating our what we called our I Heart Main Street program. And so basically, what we're doing is we're working with BIAs. Um, I started off the first year, our pilot year. We worked with like 10 BIAs, I believe, across Toronto. And in, and in the second year, it had exploded. And we worked with like 20, over 20 BIAs across Ontario. Um, and so basically we're working with these BIAs to do uh, placemaking projects. And so um, this could look a number of different ways. So it was like creating murals, but it was also like, remember during the pandemic and there was those like social distancing circles on the floor. Um, so instead of having those like stands six feet apart, we would actually get artists to come and, and like actually make some sort of a digital mural and then like paste them across uh, the, the, the neighborhood as a way of adding a pop oh, of cool. color because, you know, people were so scared to go outside and rightfully so, but um, ultimately other than like obviously the frontline workers and the community members who were hurting. Um, also the businesses that uh, were relying on foot traffic that aren't big box stores like, um, you know, Walmart or whatever. Um, they weren't getting the foot traffic they needed to, to, to stay alive. And so the BIAs or the BIAs I was working with were working really, really, really hard to A, make um, make the city, make the the, the main streets um Making making it amenable, making it comfortable for folks, so they would come back and support the businesses that they need to, who also have you know families to support and are also part of the community as well. So as much as their work was, their place making efforts was about supporting business, it was about actually a community building too. Um, and then now um, I also uh, work with. Um, uh, Plaza Pops, I'm on their board, and they do really, really, really cool work. And they're uh, an organization that works with uh, BIAs, particularly in more of the outskirts of Toronto, so more in the suburb suburban areas, which are, are like the inner sub sub suburb suburban areas um, that don't have a lot of public space, but are are quite car oriented, and that's just the way that the city has been designed. And so, as a result, their main streets are less, or their BIAs are less along main streets, where you know along principal road, so where you can access them uh, via transit, they're more strip mall oriented. Um, and recognizing that uh, these communities, typically like uh, diverse communities need uh, space that they don't have access to in order to congregate. Uh, they work with artists, they work with community organizations, they work with very closely with BIAs to take a portion of their parking lots and turn them into like parks, ultimately, little oases where people can convene to eat food, to talk to they host programming events movie nights and all these different things so i would say that's so weird to hear <laughs> that a bia would respond yeah. in such a way especially one that's so like 720 stores i'm just trying to picture unless they're all like like stacked uh i'm imagining the the, the, the spread like across it's the a street it's, it, yeah i'm imagining it's yeah. huge so that's to get only to to make such a decision based on like 20 businesses i'm, I'm curious there's, there's more obviously more going on here but i'm just curious like the plot thickens. Yeah. I want to know more, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it's it's definitely like it is very much a developing yeah. story. Like this is going to be really interesting. Maybe I'll uh, I'll provide some additional context here so that people can kind of see where where we're talking about um, with this with this BIA. So this is uh, this is McLeod Trail. Lots of people have heard about McLeod Trail on this show and elsewhere. Um, it is the worst strode in Calgary. <laughs> Um, this is this is the BMO Center, and right now 17th Avenue is being extended into our kind of these are stampede grounds. Uh, the new event center is going to be over here. This is where we currently play hockey at the Saddle Dome. Um, but 17th Ave, the BIA kind of like it runs all the way along here. Yeah. So it's all of these businesses here are involved in this, um, and and in the summer in the summer they do some really great great work 
uh, with placemaking. You know, they, they tighten the street a little bit. They open up these patios. They allow for pedestrians to, to walk on this way. They've got some really cool boardwalk stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's like, it's a great place. People love being here. Um, and there are so many great restaurants, like amazing restaurants down this, down this strip. And, uh, but the, the cars driving by really make it a hostile environment. Mm -hmm. Um, especially, you know, you get a lot of aftermarket exhaust and stuff. And so having, having these patios here and then having the cars go by, it just makes it rough. And, and what people in Calgary are trying to do is have a conversation about, um, about creating this space that is obviously a space for people obviously a place that people love to come and love to be actually saying you know what this this is just for people like we're going to focus on that uh and and create this in, into just the best space that it could be so there are lots of ways to do that there are lots of ways to make compromises without getting rid of cars completely right mm -hmm. uh, lots of people bring up the the need for accessibility there are doctor's offices along here right so like there there are other businesses it's not just restaurants it's not just parties and events right um and so there but the conversation is important and it's disappointing the way that this bia or at least this BIA representative, uh, because there there's so many people in there. I don't want to lump them all in one category. Mm -hmm. um, it's disappointing the way that uh, that this indiv individual was responded to when he was trying to engage in this ongoing conversation about how we engage and interact with our city. And so, hopefully, mm -hmm. hopefully this is just allowing it to kind of grow a little bit more and us to have this conversation a little bit clearer um, as as businesses, as individuals who frequent the area, as people who live in the area, as people who want the city to be uh, a, a great place. So there's my there's my additional context and a little bit of preaching uh, mm -hmm. added on at the end. No, but I, I think you're right. Because like, so I was just looking, obviously, I haven't been there. So I don't know what it looks like. But like, the one thing that came to mind was like, benches, I have this like, mm -hmm. secret I just like I love benches. <laughs> Whenever I go to different yeah. cities, I look at their benches, and that tells me a lot about like kind of how they're oriented towards people or not. Like for example, the litmus test. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's it, the litmus test. So I love a good bench, um, <laughs> and it really started because yeah, during that work, one of the projects I forget which BIA it was in a more rural area, but they they came to us a really interesting uh, I guess challenge where they're like, oh, we have a like a big elderly population and they can't get from one end of our BIA to the other. And I was like, Oh my gosh, that's so sad. What the heck? So they're like, okay, yeah. we're going to, we're going to make some benches or we're going to, we're going to buy some benches. Can you paint them? And we're like, of course we can do that. We can, we can find you an artist to paint your benches. Um, and they did. And, and, and that's what, you know, that's what happened. And then, uh, and funnily enough, in the first year that we had um, done this project as, uh, as well. So as I mentioned before, as part of our, like, these different BIA's COVID-19 recovery strategies. And there was still that like, you know, social distancing thing going on. And so there's, and you brought up a good point where there's businesses that are, uh, that are uh, uh, like restaurants. So they would benefit from mm -hmm. things like uh, what we have in Toronto, it's called Cafe TO. So what allows people to actually have those like sidewalk or on street, uh, like cafe patio things. Um, so yeah, they have their own thing, which was, which was good, but you have these in between strips of a main street that are like, that are mainly service oriented. And so they're not really not necessarily like the doctor's office not, is not necessarily getting the foot traffic that a, like, you know, a local pub is getting at the same time. And so there's some like dead zones. And so one way to kind of bring one of those dead zones to life was um, they, they use their patio space to create a little uh, pop-up park. Again, they took up, I think two parking spots. They, we got a, an artist to paint one, uh, a mural on one of them and, a, and a, an artist to paint on another mural and then they brought in these planter boxes we brought in a bench um and it was funny because initially the one of the businesses was like he wasn't he wasn't into it he was really not <laughs> not a big fan of it but i remember what the bia the executive director was telling me um it's funny uh it was funny for him because he he actually you know was walking down the main street and he was uh um, observing how people were interacting with the space and funnily enough he was watching as there was a group of people walking by and uh they ended up looking like they turned right and they saw the mural and it happened to be this giant fish, which is pretty eye catching. So anyway, he said they saw the fish yeah. and they're like, Oh, okay, interesting. And then they turn around and then where did they go? They walked directly into that business that the one that was mm. like, you know, hating on the mural ultimately. So it seems it's, 
a lot of the work, whether it's planning or cultural planning or public art, is actually convincing people to do that, like these small things uh, make a difference and they, they really do. They're kind of hard to quantify, which I think is why some people get scared. Like the amount of people I have to convince about paint, like people are really scared of paint. And I have to tell them, I'm like, it will wash off. Like it will go away. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it being there permanently. Yeah. But like the mm -hmm. fear of paint, the fear of like pink and like different colors. It, 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 and I understand why, because, you know, take, it's a risk and it's not the norm, but like we need these little just like little little risks in order to make things a little better or sometimes a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. It can make a big difference. Um, yeah. I appreciate your insights into that. Um, kind of giving like some good examples of how these things can be scary. I mean, change is scary. Yeah. Right. Um, but then also like being able to see like, okay, it's making a difference. Right. And, and having that conversation and uh, yeah, as we wrap up this p specific conversation about BIAs, I just want to say like, they've got a tough job to do. They have a lot of people to please. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I'm sure they, they work hard to, to do that. So the, this isn't any hate uh, to BIAs and it's certainly not libel or I guess we're speaking. <laughs> so it's not slander. Um, yeah. Yeah. Nick, you look like you have a thought. No, I'm just excited no. for Alexandra to talk about this next story. I was just reading the yeah. article. <laughs> yeah, take it away, Alexandra. I th this kind of fits in. Yeah, okay. So this article, um, I saw it. Sorry, I'm pulling up the title again. So yeah, basically it's titled, Toronto has a new food hall where all restaurants are run by newcomers and refugees. And I got excited for two reasons. A, because I love a good food hall. B, okay, so three reasons. B, <laughs> I, <laughs> I love a good food hall, number one. I went to this really interesting one in Chicago, which I guess is a story, I'll share it later. But anyway, I went to this really cool one in Chicago and that really made me appreciate like these alternative ways of like, I guess, grouping food in one space because in, in, in the opportunities it creates for like, not only to experience other cultures, but then also just to like, I don't know, see the city in new light and congregate in different ways. Um, yeah, it was called the timeout market in Chicago. It was really cool. I was, okay, I, I'm still going to, I'm going to tell the story now, but basically long story short is I went with a group of friends, all of us urban planners. They were like, actually my classmates from my, my cohort. And we're like, okay, we're going to Chicago. Um, and I don't know what happened. We decided to do eat all the tourist food. So like, it was like a lot of bread. It was a lot of meat <laughs> and not a lot of vegetables. <laughs> and so... Yeah. Um, at one point in our trip, we were there for like, I think four days. Uh, some of it, we had it all broken off into like different, like, you know, to do our own in, uh, different activities. And so me and a few friends decided we're like, okay, we're going to the timeout market. We're going to go find something to eat with greens. And I remember going there and there was this like huge food hall and there's like these picnic tables and lights and it was just like bumping and it was all these different things. I was like, I just need some rice. <laughs> and so I went to one restaurant and it was like an Indian restaurant and I got rice and mushrooms. And I went to a Mexican restaurant right next door and I got plantains and I was like, this is it. And that was heaven. And that saved my trip, my trip and my stomach uh, throughout the rest of Chicago. So I have a deep appreciation for food halls now. Um, but anyway, the second story was that um, I used to be part of the Toronto Youth Food Policy Council. And so I I was deep in the like food justice, food systems kind of like, I guess, like world for like a hot minute. Um, and so any, anything that has to do with food um, gets me really excited. And then the last thing is this idea of entrepreneurship, because it's not just a food hall. It's an entrepreneurship incubator. So like personally, a lot of the research I do is um, and the research that we do at Untitled Planning is um, around community economic development and it's related particularly related to entrepreneurship like my own like I guess we have like our thesis that we do for our, our degree and mine was about uh, looking at um, like social procurement and businesses and particularly around how to support small um, to medium enterprises particularly like how to support um, like um, minority businesses um, minority owned businesses so yeah, I thought this was really cool to give a space where newcomers and refugees that are, you know, coming from their own countries with like highly skilled, often highly skilled, um, you know, with all these different, um, I guess, like resources and know-how. And then they come here and because of all these silly kind of like, um, I guess, demands that we put on them, they don't they don't get a chance to, I guess, exercise in their field or maybe to um, explore other pathways um, in the same way that, you know, some of us who are like born here get to do as well. So I think this is an interesting blend of a bringing uh, more diversity in terms of like food or all, although I will add like Toronto is really big on like you can get almost any kind of food here. So this is just another 
yeah. way to add more to the landscape of diverse food across our city. But um, I think the particular spin on this on, uh, focusing on entrepreneurship, uh, incubating entrepreneurship. So hopefully these businesses aren't necessarily stuck in this incu in this incubator in this particular hall. They can go on and expand to you know other parts of the city or other parts of the country if, if if they desire. But I think giving a foundation for them to grow from is really really cool, and I hope that you know they all see the success that they're looking for. So yeah. That's awesome. This is, this is super cool. Nick, you were excited about this. Do you have any questions or thoughts? Well, my thoughts is like these, these places aren't just, you know, I think the merits of this of being an incubator for newcomers to the country is incredible. And I absolutely love that. But these places are absolutely community hubs. And I, my mind always comes back to just the mall because I, I grew up in a pretty suburban place like London, mm -hmm. Ontario. I was a teenager in London, Ontario. And that was the place to go to with your friends when I was a teenager to go hang out. But it wasn't just us. It was a lot of elderly people too. They'd go there for people watching to meet up with their friends. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, we need more of these places and to see it like this. And it's not just filled with your, you know, your typical suspects, your orange Julius and, you know, Tim Hortons <laughs> and Taco Bell or whatever <laughs> is amazing. I absolutely love express this. express there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sabaro. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it is really exciting to see the kind of like food hall revival. It almost it kind of feels like we're taking baby steps closer and closer towards kind of bringing back the whole city market idea, you know, like mm -hmm. places like Pike Place in Seattle or Reading Terminal in Philadelphia or the Grand Central Market in L.A. A lot of these like older, you know, city markets where you not only had, you know, food options for like immediate dining, but you also had, you know, produce stands, butchers, you know, everything like that, you know, delis mm -hmm. and just places where these smaller businesses could have a place to thrive because these stalls mm -hmm. generally compared to what we have out in the suburbs where you need to get a whole building just to have <laughs> even the most basic of businesses mm -hmm. generally isn't as economically sustainable for these smaller businesses and having these sort of city markets or food halls is a really, really good way of allowing these kinds of opportunities for people, you know, who don't have the amount of capital to, you know, go and rent out what was formerly a Taco Bell or Pizza Hut in the suburbs and actually, you know, have the room to make a business with, you know, less square footage and just give someone an option to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and hopefully being more accessible, you know, by by foot or or bicycle, right? Like all the places like I went to a few different places uh, in Montreal when I was there a couple months ago. And, and the best places were the ones where it was like, you get off the train and you just like walk up the escalator and you're there, right? Mm -hmm. Like those are always the best places, like creating more accessible places instead of just it being like the mall's food court, right? Like you got to go, you got to go. If there is transit there, then you probably have to walk across a big parking lot, uh, from, from that transit in order to get into the people space. Um, and, and so stuff like this, I also want to highlight like the variety of foods that, that are here. So I kind of clicked through some of these, some of these places. So we've got, uh, Indian, Thai, Caribbean, uh, East Asian, Mexican, and, uh, and there's also a place that, uh, uh, is for vegetarian and vegan subs, you know, like. Uh, being able to have this variety of food in places. That's another nice thing about these things. You can meet up with people here and everybody's happy. Yeah. You know, like everybody just like find mm -hmm. what you want. This is our table. Come back and, uh, and, and we'll hang out. And it's a great place to try something new. You know, you might grab something one day, but then see something on your way out uh, that, that you might want to try. You know, I got this super random anecdote just that I wanted to share. So I, I had some... Indian food with my friends the other night. And I was talking to another friend of mine who lives in Ontario. And I was just telling him at this restaurant, I was like, next time you come to Vancouver, you got to try it. It's best Indian food I've had in Vancouver. And he goes, oh, I've never had curry before. I'm like, hey, really? Like, like, what, like Thai curry? He's like, nope. I was like, how? How is that possible? Like, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. next time I'm going to force feed him some curry. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, next time I'm in Toronto, <laughs> I'm checking out this food court. Cause uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting hungry right now thinking about all this. 
You know yeah, what it was I was a great say. article between lunch and dinner for me, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alexandra. <laughs> no, you made us well, all hungry. <laughs> it's so funny. Have you have you been to this place, Alex? No, I'm I've been meaning to. It's funny. I'm just messaging my friend, and she's like, "What are you free to go?" And I'm like, "I'm not, but I will go." <laughs> <laughs> I'm not for the next few weeks, but I'm. It's on my list. It's, I'm really excited to check it out. But it's funny you brought up the idea or that idea of but you're talking about the malls and that's also another like i guess small like love of mine as well like that idea about yeah being a teenager and then not having somewhere to go um in another life that would have been like my research like focus as well is like trying to see like making space actually for teenagers in in the cities because they're often left out or like youth are left out of um how we Mm -hmm. design our spaces and where they can congregate so i used to work at the public library and so a lot of my I, i was like shelving the books and so you end up i used to drop out a lot of conversations there's nothing else to do honestly so um but it was just funny to go around and 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 then observe the kind and then also took a public space course so we actually and then actually had to go and analyze how you know people were using the library and at least that was my my designated site or the site that i had selected and yeah observing the multitude of people observing first of all who uses libraries which is everybody but i was trying to see who like used it the most and you and i remember every morning there was this collective of like elderly people that would come and congregate around the newspapers and then they would sit there and read their newspapers and chat and there was like their own friendship circle there's another group of like nannies that would come in for context it's like a, ch- a children's library um, and the in the neighborhood where i live is very like there's kids everywhere there's schools everywhere so it makes sense so the nannies would come together and congregate and they would let the kids just run wild and they would just have their own like play date area on the side and then amongst the books and then after school i would observe my fellow teens would come in and like you know either do their homework get tutoring or just like sit there and like gossip and my sister who's a teenager now like that's like they love the libraries where they go to hang out and actually our local library just closed down for repairs. So they're like, where are we going to go? And I'm like, good luck. I don't know. <laughs> there's not, there's not really not much yeah. out there for you. So the mall ends up being like, um, if it's not your friend's house, if, if your friend has space these days, given like, you know, where we're at with the housing and, and different things, um, you know, you end up at the mall, but then the mall is also not always that amenable. But I, I think it's interesting how I, I've seen malls like transform not all of them, but in different ways. I recently went to the Vaughn Mills, which is a little bit out of the way, so a different city. And I saw they had a like a it's like a co working space in one of the one of the mm. sort of a store. Yeah, it was a, a co working space in Eden Center downtown. There's a mall. They now have a they run it with uh, basically an, an entrepreneurship uh, design art gallery space slash incubator space that's run with like a, a professor at OCAD. And like, it's called Design With, it's really cool. And then they're also working with like these different women from uh, the Regent Park neighborhood and they do all kinds of like workshops on how to like make shoes and all these different things, it's very cool. And then the mall, um, there's a mall that I go to, which is actually near this food hall where um, there's like a gym, but there's also a public library and it's like one of the largest libraries, it's beautiful. Um, Yeah, so there's a library in there, but then my favorite part of that mall is that in the basement, like right before you like, go and go to the gym, there's a group of old ladies that always come and do Tai Chi and they're so cute. Um, and huh. yeah, I'm like, I don't know why they particularly picked this random corner in the basement of the mall, but it works for them and I'm happy to see it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think like you talking about libraries, like these are a really special um, place in our neighborhoods that aren't just for pulling out books. Like I, the one, the place that I work at uh, is right by a library. And so whenever I get to work early, I'll usually just sit in the library for a little bit, write in my journal and people watch. And then when it's time to go, I pack my things up and I, I peace out. Um, we do got to keep moving. Uh, got though, a boogie on. Mm-hmm. We, yeah, we, we got a boogie on. We have like a we have a lot of things we want to get to today, yeah. so uh, I'm I'm going to throw this over to Nick for his story. Yeah, this one's the definitely downer story. So this happened yesterday. This news came out. So driver alleged, sorry, no, nope, starting here. Syed Mosfegi Zadeh pleaded not guilty to dangerous operation of a vehicle causing death and dangerous operation of a vehicle causing bodily harm in July 6th, 2021 crash. Zadeh failed to see four red lights, which had been red for over 20 seconds, and pedestrians crossing the street, his SUV hit another vehicle before jumping the curb and fatally striking a 23-month-old baby and her father, Michael Hiva. And the judge ruled that while Zade's single momentary lapse of attention had a tragic outcome, it was not a criminal 
act. And let me just add right now that this driver is alleged gang member driving with a forged license and had two phones in the car for which apparently was no evidence of him using at the time of the accident. Hmm. And I'm thinking, if, is, is there no other responsibility to, to driving your car than watching out for a red light and stopping? It seems like that is negligent homicide, like at, at the least. It's, it's mind-blowing. Yeah. So I remember when this, this happened, this was like three years ago, that uh, he killed this baby and hurt the, the father very badly. And it's just incredibly sad that this happens over and over and over <laughs> And we're not actually doing anything about it, you know, and it it really bugs me because like I said earlier, I said, I was going to come back to this, this story coming from city council right now in Vancouver and trying to get at least the local streets to be 30 kilometers per hour. It would not count on towards this street. That would not be applicable on this street because this happened downtown on a main arterial for which the speeds are 50 kilometers per hour. However, if it was 30 kilometers per hour, how would these situations come out differently? You know, if this driver still wasn't speeding, say he was going 50 kilometers per hour, Mm. what if he was going 30 kilometers per hour? What if that was the speed limit? What if we designed our streets for that to be the case? How many of these stories would just simply not happen anymore? You know, and that's the thing that I think needs to change and has been changing in some places. I don't know if you guys have heard the news coming out of Hoboken in Jersey City. They made all of their streets 20 miles per hour Mm. a few years ago. Wow. They have reached vision zero. They did it. They have had no fatalities on the streets. It's possible. Yeah. We can do this. Yeah. And it's just so annoying to me that we just have the same things happen over and over and over. And we just go, oh, that's too bad. It's a tragic accident. No, like this is, we know it's going to happen again. It's going to happen on yeah. our streets again until we change things. Absolutely. I see. One thing I always say is that you can pretty much get away with any crime if you commit it with a car. It's like seriously, like if you want a lighter sentence, just do something with a car instead of, you know, any other weapon. Hmm. A car is a very much a tool like anything else. And if you misuse it, like in this case, you you just get away with it. Like, I feel like we just don't punish crimes that involve cars. We, we, no. DUIs are practically jokes. Most people, yeah, like seriously, like you'll, you'll hear people and they'll talk about, you know, having a DUI, like it was like going 10 miles above the speed limit. Like, I don't think that's the equivalent, but yeah, we, we really need to treat, you know, these kinds of, these kinds of actual crimes and negligence and malicious, maliciousness in some cases, like actual crimes rather than, you know, a needless accident. And, you know, even the term accident is, incredibly problematic. Yeah. And and I think I need to drive a point home here too. And if we can be as as generous to this driver as possible and say, yes, we've all had lapses in judgment while driving. I've driven and you zone out for a while, never had an accident, but it happens, right? Let's say that's what happened. Okay. Then it's going to happen again. If it was just an, you know, honest mistake that caused this crash, we need to change the environment so it doesn't happen. And we're not doing that. Yeah. And that's my point. Yeah. If you're not blaming the driver, you have to blame the engineers. And you don't yep. have to point the finger. Mm-hmm. This has to be like a coroner's inquest after somebody dies. It's not trying to point a finger and say, you're at fault. You need to pay for this. It's to say, how did this person die? How can we make sure this doesn't happen again? We need to make our streets yep. safer, make them more complex so that when people are in cars, they are forced by their subconscious to pay attention. So our streets are safer. Yeah. 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 Uh, and Nick, you had a great video on that that came out today uh, about J- Japan Street, mm-hmm. about building, building narrower, making it complicated, make it like these complex environments so that your brain is forced to pay attention instead of, I don't know, I don't know what road this happened on, but it's in Canada. So I assume it, the lanes were probably too wide and thing like you've got slip lanes and you've got uh, far side traffic signals you've got lack of bollards, you've got poor sidewalk infrastructure, right? You're prioritizing cars at every turn. The cars are going to be prioritized, right? Like it's not a shock to anybody. It's not surprising to anybody. This is just like, it's, it's just expected now. Uh, whereas, whereas when, when a cyclist, you know, Nick, you, you shared that little skit that you did with us last week. When, when a cyclist goes too fast, be uh, uh, around somebody it becomes news 
right? Like that's an important news story, right? Like these young people on their scooters, Alexandra, you're talking about like where people go to spend time and that teenagers are often just like forgotten. And that that's why kids rush to get their driver's license when they turn 16 so that suddenly now they can go somewhere. But guess what? You just gave a teenager a driver's license and you made it simple. You made it easy to do because it's important and it's critical that they have it in order to participate in anything. But then you make it so easy for somebody to commit crimes like Ethan's talking about with with a vehicle. If you want to murder somebody, do it with a car because you're going to get off. Yeah. And it's, it's really sad. And I don't know if anybody else, else has to say anything about this, but yeah, I'm just sending my condolences to the family because there's yeah, no yeah, bringing back yeah. this, this child that they lost. It's a tragic accident. And I don't know how this would affect them in their healing to, to know that the person who was responsible for the death of their child is getting off on criminal charges. It's, it's really, I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm speechless really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any other thoughts on that before we move on? <laughs> let's no? so, yeah. All right. All right. Let's bring it back up. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's bring it back. Uh, we've got a little fire and yeah. fury and, and uh, sadness, sadness there. But uh, we want to ask Alexandra a few, uh, a few questions here. Uh, Nick, why don't you uh, ask your yeah, question? Yeah. Um, I'm not going to ask this one I've written, but I've got another one in my brain right now because I've been listening to your podcast and it's fantastic. Urban Limitrophe. Thank yep. you. If you're listening to this podcast right now, anybody out there, just turn it off right now. Go listen to Alex. Alex Delete it. podcast. <laughs> it's fantastic. Us. Unsubscribe. <laughs> well, well edited. Great, great guests. Thank you. And the, when did I listen? I don't remember when I listened to it. I think it's one of your earlier podcasts. And you were talking about, as we were talking about just earlier, about young people in third places and having places to go. And you were talking about having, like, for example, skate parks. We don't build our cities for the youth to have places to go. We don't build for them. We're building for, for adults and things like that. So I'm wondering what things can we do to better accommodate the youth so they have things mm -hmm. to do and places to go? That's a good point. That's a good, that's a good question. I think one of my favorite episodes um, from Urban Limitro where we talked a little bit about that was um, the case of the Mafra Foundation in Ghana. And basically, funnily enough, talking about markets, they were talking about um, uh, yeah, in the, in the markets in Ghana, they're quite noisy, they're quite loud, they're quite boisterous. But then often the 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 owners or the, the business people that are working in these in these uh, in these markets are women who are who are often mothers <laughs> who have who have small children, you know, that they need to take take care of um, ultimately. And um, but so you end up having uh, or what my guest was explaining is that the the children end up you know actually not having a lot of stimulation. They don't have anything to do per, per se. And so what they did is that they worked with the Moffer Foundation and they worked with the different, you know, entrepreneurs. Um, and they created a little like park, a little park within the, like the, the, um, within the, sorry, within the market for the children to have a place to play, to learn um, and, you know, enjoy themselves. So ultimately I would say it's the same thing. If for, whether you're creating for something, creating a space within a market and whether you're creating a space within a city, you need to a talk, <laughs> with these you need to talk with teens you need to talk with youth understand what is it that they need because it's also nuances there's another group um they're called uh make space for girls in the uk and they're actually looking at um it's not just creating space for teenagers it's also creating space particularly for like uh you know the differences amongst teenagers but particularly teenage girls who have a different set of needs because at that age you're dealing with all these different kind of either societal pressures you know uh family pressures cultural pressures about who you can or cannot interact with when you can or cannot go outside so there's also other sorts of um um i guess measures you need to put in place when you're designing a space to make it more comfortable for them like for example i remember reading this article and they were talking about basketball courts um and often i haven't i haven't experienced these basketball courts in, in myself because most of the ones I see are at school so they're quite open and there's there's no cage uh what's it called fences around them but in some cities apparently they are fenced and so they're talking about how one of the issues with one uh some of these courts when they're designed that way is that if there's only one entrance a lot of girls actually don't feel comfortable going into the space because they might be you might be blocked there's only one entrance there's only one way for you to get in or out so they hmm. don't necessarily want to go in period and if there is a group of guys already out there you know doing their thing they might feel a little less comfortable, uh, you know, even trying to like get involved or trying to take up space for themselves. So 
it's a no. So they suggested, you know, having two entryways. So it's like little, little, little simple things like that, um, that can go a long way in making people feel comfortable in the space, but also like designing a space where they can enjoy themselves. Um, but yeah, so I guess that wasn't really a straight answer because it, there's, I think there's a lot that needs to be done, but it's also like, I think very context specific. Cause like one thing I've been thinking about, like I was telling you, telling you all before I was doing like placemaking interventions. Um, but you know, for context, these projects were all in the summer, but we're in Canada. And so what do you do during the winter? Like winter placemaking is actually a really interesting topic um, that I haven't like fully, yeah. uh, fully wrapped my head around because I am like a warm weather person. <laughs> so like in the winter, you don't really <laughs> see me outside if I can avoid it. So I'm just always trying to think about like what, what could possibly get me to go outside? Like I love ice skating. I like figure skating. So I'll go, I will like go out of my way to go um, and find some ice, but like, it's still not everyone's like that. <laughs> so, and then not everyone can yeah. skate yeah. and it's not accessible for everybody. So what, what can be done? Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing. I have mm. a question for you. Um, and that is, so your, your podcast, urban limit Trove, mm. again, uh, it's a great show. Um, and you talk specifically about, urbanism across Africa and the African mm -hmm. diaspora. And so like, I'm, I'm wondering, cause in the urbanist space, like we mostly talk about like Western Europe yeah. and some like Eastern yeah. Asia, right? Like there's a lot, there's a lot that just like gets like skipped over. Right. And most of these channels are based in, you know, the U S mm -hmm. and Canada. Uh, thankfully, a lot in Canada, like more than <laughs> you, know, you would expect in, in Canada. Uh, Which makes sense. We got to study. Um, we got to study the ratio of Canadian <laughs> urbanists in the space and just why. That would be that would be interesting. We do have like a, a significant amount, uh, but I'm curious, like what is what is one specific thing that you have seen is like kind of a characteristic of African urbanism that you think would be great to just like broadcast and, and uh, maybe see adopted outside of that sphere? Mm, that's a good question. I'd say, honestly, and this is the thing that actually sparked me wanting to create that podcast was um, there's this like strong spirit of just like, I guess, informality, and that makes sense. And that's just mm. like, just trying, just trying things. There's a running joke um, in Toronto yeah. about like Toronto being um, like, we never want to be the first to try anything. We want to be like the 131st. And then we're like, okay, then we'll try it. And then we'll try it. And then we won't actually like put in all the policies in place to actually make it as good as what we were trying to copy. And then it doesn't work. And we're like, ah, oh, forget about it. <laughs> and we'll never do it again. Right, right. It's sort of like the, the analogy I would use. And I, it's not just Toronto. It's other like, you know, we talked about the BIA earlier today um, and being afraid, essentially. And I talked about my experience with people with paint, you know, just being scared to paint things. But like when I went to uh, I went to Congo, I went to Mumbashi to see my family. I just saw people were just trying and, and everything and some things didn't work, but a lot of things did. Like the most interesting, innovative, interesting thing to me when I got there was that um, it's a recurring issue, particularly um, in Congo, but also like I, I think across the continent is is energy ultimately. Um, but what's interesting, the, the way that the city or uh, I shouldn't say the city, I would say citizens <laughs> have gotten around it is by um, uh, basically they, they, they rely on solar, uh, solar energy. I mean, there are actually a number of different ways. There's people, they have like generators. <laughs> there's people who don't have electricity. There's people that, um, you know, are actually like using different electrical, like pulling electricity from like other like wires, other their neighbors and, you know, coming together in, in collectivity to 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 like figure out their own uh, energy issues. But the last thing is actually solar energy. Um, and I thought that was interesting because there was like solar powered fridges, solar powered TVs, solar powered, like honestly, like everything you could think of solar powered. And I thought that was really interesting because, you know, on the flip side in, in Canada, or at least at the time, a, a lot of there's a lot of ret reticence. I mean, we're making strides, obviously, towards using more renewable energies, but there is a, a lot of ret reticence to use, let's say, these energies in a way that's more, I guess, 
uh, accessible in that way. So I thought that was interesting, that that spirit of like informality of just wanting to try something. But I'll also say that spirit of collectivity. Um, there's a really, I think, strong understanding that like if you do things alone, you're not going to make it. You need to group people together. And these are people from different walks of life, from different skills, different backgrounds, um, all within these different places to try and make it work when, you know, in the face of adversity, whatever that looks like, um, whether it's like political adversity, but it could also just be like financial um situations as well or energy like i just i gave an example of but it's really using what you have um using the people you have and the skills you have to try and make the best of what you can and honestly like thriving most often than not so yeah yeah i i appreciate that's a great insight uh and that is like something that we struggle with so much in canada and the u.s is just like these constant studies instead of just being like you know what interesting idea why don't we try it uh and just and just kind of going out and um engaging on that local and community level just to like make the places we care about a little bit better and yeah like you said some things will work and some things mm -hmm. won't i yeah i appreciate that insight ethan do you have a question uh in the interest of time i am going to save any questions right now it's just we're we're kind of we're pushing it <laughs> We're we we are pushing it. Uh, we're we're obviously going to have to have you back Absolutely. on the show. I think we want to do like a show with both you and Sammy, where we can just like dive into <laughs> you guys and like what sure you're thing. working on and stuff. Uh, where it's not just like focused on the news. Uh, we did start doing news shows, so that's like a format yeah. we can do. Now. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I I want to skip. We we had a whole section planned. Uh, talking about like e-bikes and stuff because it was a question we asked in our last episode. Um, but I feel like if if we do that now, we're going to just like blow through it and not actually get time to discuss it. So I actually, I want to end off on Jen's question because uh, it'll it'll be interesting to hear Alex's answer as as well. So Jen Hall, friend of the show, former, former co-host as well. She says, Local urbanism community groups have been one of my favorite discoveries from getting into urbanism. Please share some of your favorite urbanism groups. For example, strong towns, critical mass, etc. Uh, Ethan, do you want to start us off? Yeah, so all these groups are great that Jen listed. Um, strong towns, always good. Love Mike Pasternak. He's the guy behind their whole media team, you know, online. But one group that I think goes unrecognized a lot of the time Parking Reform Network is probably one of my favorites out there. And it's just, they do such a great job of showing how much space in our cities is wasted specifically on parking. And then they also do a really good job of showing, you know, like what cities are up to on, you know, getting rid of parking minimums. And it's just something that's just such a small change that makes such a big difference for cities. So yeah, go check out Parking Reform Network. You can see they have this really cool, you know, thing on their page where you can see how much of a certain city's downtown is covered by parking and if they're doing anything to fix it or not. Hmm. I like that. Uh, Alex, do you have a favorite group? I mean, that's a tough one. I mean, my whole podcast is highlighting my favorite group, so <laughs> I'm trying to pick one. <laughs> <laughs> trying to pick one is a little bit tricky. Uh, yeah, okay, well. All those aside, if I have to give a, another light to some other ones, um, like just like urbanist, like specific, because it's that's also a tough one. Um, okay, I have like three that come to mind, so I'm just gonna n name the names and you look them up after. <laughs> I think there's there's okay. the Parkdale's People <laughs> Economy in Toronto. They do such great work, like just like between like running a community land trust doing all these different economic initiatives they have an event actually coming up on the 27th where they're celebrating i can't remember they, they did some sort of like community plan but like all I, i'm saying if you're in toronto on the 27th of april i believe check it out head on to their site and see all the interesting work that they're doing they, they do too many things i don't even have enough time to actually go through all of it um another group i would say is mm -hmm. more neighbors toronto we were talking about this a little bit earlier but like they do um, basically, they're trying to be the Yimbies that are fighting against the NIMBYs going out there and saying, yes, we need civic action. We need civic participation. It seems scary. It seems tough, but it's so important. And if you do it together, it makes it actually really fun. I, on a side note, I went to a deputation uh, two days ago and it took a minute, but it was the drama. It was I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Draft Day. Um, and basically, the whole film is like 
trying to figure out who the next the top NFL pick will be um, for the year. Um, but it was like that, mm. but <laughs> in real life and about city issues. So I recommend <laughs> getting involved. And then my last one, as I mentioned before, was Plaza Pops. They do such amazing work with community engagement, at the, uh, economic development and, and placemaking. So check them all out. <laughs> Awesome. awesome. Yeah, thank you. And Nick? Uh, there's several in Vancouver that I'm interested in. And I help with uh, Vision Zero Vancouver. I absolutely love that group. It is a very dedicated group of volunteers. Uh, we talked about the brick thing last week that I helped make with yeah. them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm also involved in the Strong Towns conversation here in Vancouver. That's very, very new in Vancouver. So it's growing. If you're interested in that in Vancouver, please come out to the meetings. I've learned a lot already from them. But I think my favorite no, no shade on anybody else, but hub cycling in Vancouver mm-hmm. is because mm. they are teaching the youth to get on two wheels. And more than that, they're teaching people who might be afraid of that. People who are minorities or uh, a lot of uh, adult women who have never ridden a bike, helping them get on two wheels. And I absolutely love that, that they're, they're teaching the city to ride the future generation mostly, which is just absolutely what we need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, For me, I've got to go with More Neighbors Calgary, uh, largely modeled after More Neighbors Toronto. Uh, We've got an active Discord server. Uh, The people in there, like I'm, I learn so much from them. And there are people in there who are just like (laughs) the nerdiest people about developments happening around the city. And we have the almost like watch parties of these, of these meetings, uh, which really makes it a lot more entertaining and a little less dry. Uh, to watch those things. So yeah, I, I invite anybody uh, to actually comment down down in the comments, what are some of your favorite areas answer or favorite organizations? Uh, answer Jen's question here, because I think it's really important that we find those groups in our area. They are in your area, they do exist. And so hopefully some conversation can happen down in the comments uh, to to get people out. Uh, Nick, do you want to start uh, wrapping us up? Yeah, I've got a recommendation. So I talked about it just briefly last week. This is a book that I just finished reading today, actually, and it's called City Limits. And this is by Megan Kimball, Infrastructure, Inequality, and the Future of American Highways. And this is probably one of my top five urbanist books that I've ever read, most likely, I would say. And it's not because I think it has the most wisdom or anything, but I found it the most enjoyable. It was very readable. And that's what I look for in a book, because if it's going to get me to finish the book, I think that's a top quality to have in a book. But it's about Texas DOT and about their highway expansion and not just about the stuff that many of us know about, about highway expansion in the United States, mostly about destroying cities and most overwhelmingly in, in black communities. They talk about that a lot. But what I really love about this, it's not a high bird's eye view. They really, she, Megan really gets down and talks to people. It focuses mostly on this one woman, uh, Modesty Cooper. Uh, she's a black woman who works for the armed forces. And it's about her story. She built this house and the fight that she had to try. She's still going through to try to keep her house from getting demolished. Something she built from the ground up. It's, hmm. it's heartbreaking, but I absolutely love books when they they really dig into the people's experience because it really brings home how much this stuff affects people but what i really loved about the book is how it brings it home in the end and that change is possible these things aren't a foregone conclusion you can fight against this kind of stuff and make it stop and one point that she brings up is a story from long island back in the 60s i think where a grandmother robert moses himself knocked on her door (laughs) to say that a highway is going through but your backyard or buying your house. And she met him with a shotgun, <laughs> <laughs> which is crazy. But she won in the end and New York City won, or Long Island won in the end and that highway did not get built. So it's possible to stop these things from happening. Mm-hmm. So if you know, you're out there somewhere and you see a highway expansion that you don't want happening in your city, get involved and check out if there's organizations because obviously this is mostly talking about Austin, Dallas and Houston and the organizations that are stopping, trying to stop the highway expansions there and removing highways, get involved because it, it's possible to actually change these things from happening. Mm-hmm. So that's City yeah, Limits by Megan awesome. Kimball. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. Uh, okay, let's wrap this thing up. 
Alexandra, where can people go oh, right. to find you? You can find me on Urban Limitrophe on or Urban Limitrophe podcast, depending on the platform, Instagram, Twitter, all the fun stuff. If you want to learn more about Untitled Planning, then yeah, you can find us on Untitled Planning um, on all platforms. Similarly, I have a website for both channels. So just type it in and you'll find me there. Excellent. Ethan. Folks, you can find me at Climate and Transit on pretty much everything except for Twitter. You can find me there at, at Climate Transit. I actually do have another video coming out this Friday. I can't wait to release it for you all. Excellent. Nick. I'm at Nick Laporte or Nick Vidor and other socials. And go watch his new video. And for myself. <laughs> Sorry, Alex. Yes. It is. No, no, no. Hey, it's a great video. It's a great video. It's a great video. Go, seriously, do do watch his new video. Um, my name is Alex Williams. You can find me at Humane Cities on Instagram and YouTube. And now also at, uh, at Unsprawling oh, yeah. on yeah. Instagram and Thanks. YouTube. Specifically, if you want to hear about all the urbanisty things happening in Calgary, we're about to pop off. Uh, so with that, I'll thank everybody for uh, joining us, and we'll see you next week. Folks, remember, trains are good, cars are bad. Two wheels good. And we always go feet first. <laughs>